Hi, everybody, and welcome to our next Bite Size PD with Jenna Townsend. We are going to be going over getting started with blended learning. Thank you for answering the prompt in the Zoom chat as we go throughout, uh, as you're kind of getting ready, and um, we'll kind of respond to those things. What are you looking most forward to this three-day weekend? Um, for me, I am definitely looking forward to waking up late. I'm excited about that. It's also supposed to rain possibly this weekend, maybe. And I do love some rain. So i um, quite excited about that for sure. Um, we will go ahead and get started. Uh, Jenny, if you'll go to the next one for me. So uh, first things first is just to remember to record and I will, I've already recorded. So uh, remember everything we do is going to be recorded and put on YouTube. Remember that we follow our professional development norms as we go through today. So be committed, responsible, respectful, and safe. Take care of yourself. Ask questions if you need, need them. Advocate and all of those things as we go through. The next most important thing are, um, you know, your Zoom particular professional development. Make sure your microphone is muted unless you have a question. Um, you can turn your camera on or off, blur your background, use a virtual background like me and Jenna are. Um, and if you have a comment or a question, the easiest place is to put it in the chat and that way we can get to it when uh, we have a minute. Or if you'd like to, you can raise your hand and I will also call on you as we go through. As everything in Canyon School District, we do uh, ties to our, um, our framework of systems of supports and all of the pieces. We're really focusing on that explicit instruction, that instructional hierarchy there um, for today's activity. So here are learning intentions and success criteria, and I'm going to turn it over to Jenna. For today's bite-sized PD, our learning intention is I am learning how to identify opportunities for blended learning so that I can leverage technology to enhance student collaboration and choice and repurpose my time as a teacher. You'll know that you've learned it when you have identified at least one activity that you could blend in your classroom. We're going to get started by reviewing a definition of blended learning. And then we'll move on to discuss when should we be blending versus when should we not be blending? What are the strengths and drawbacks with different activities? Uh, we're also going to apply this to the different parts of explicit instruction, including I do, we do, y'all do, and you do. Lastly, we're gonna end with a few considerations to make sure that your blended learning experience is a positive one. So what is blended learning? Blended learning is an environment in which technology is intentionally used to provide both teacher-centered and learner-centered learning experiences. And these are designed to maximize student learning and to maximize instructional time. With blended learning, there should be a seamless connection between digital and non-digital activities in the classroom, meaning that they can build on each other, and these learning experiences that leverage technology should in some way or another enhance student collaboration or student choice. And this can be choice of path, place, and or pace. So as a note, we don't have to provide all of those choice options all of the time, but some of those choice options some of the time. So choice in path, how is a student gonna get to mastery? Choice in place, where is a student going to be as they work towards mastery and pace? How long is it going to take for the student to reach mastery? Lastly, the blended learning environment repurposes our time as educators. Uh, the teacher can spend time working with small groups, checking in with individual students, circulating around the room while students are participating in those technology enhanced learner-centered experiences. So there are many benefits of blended learning. One of the first benefits is access, meaning that students can access materials when and where they need them. So we are a little more confined to the class period when we're talking about during the school day, but blended learning can provide access to materials for student review if students need to go a little slower or revisit things that other students don't need to, which would be a choice of uh, pace. 
Access can be provided to students who are absent and need to access the activities that they missed during the day. There's lots of different ways that putting our content online makes it more accessible to students. In addition to this access, it also increases opportunities for differentiation. So in the blended learning environment, when students have choice about pace, place, and path, we are able to differentiate the materials they get. It's easier to provide more options online. Um, we can also use things like mastery paths in Canvas to really direct students down a learning path that best meets their needs. And this goes hand in hand with personalization. So in some sense, students can also choose their learning path, which is a way for them to personalize that experience. Right? They can choose which materials they'd like to use to gain understanding of a concept, or maybe they can choose which product type they'd like. There's more opportunities for personalization and individualization when we have that learner-centered blended learning environment. This can also be very motivating for students when they have that personalization and when they have content that is differentiated to their needs. Again, it maximizes teacher time when we have a blended learning environment because the teacher is free to use their time for more one-on-one -on -one or small group interaction with students while students are guiding their own learning using those digital resources and activities. With personalization, enhanced motivation, maximized teacher time to be circulating around the room, we're going to have more time on task and we're also going to be preparing students for the modern world. They're going to be able to use those 21st century skills, uh, such as creating and designing and collaborating online, those same skills that they're going to need in the modern workforce. So now that we know what blended learning is and we know some of the benefits of blended learning, we have to ask ourselves when we should be blending. Does everything have to be online? No. Can we have a lesson that is purely teacher-centered and paper-based? If that's what's best for the learning intentions, then yes. So we want to choose to blend when online and student-centered advantages best support learning activities and outcomes. And the reason we say this is not everything works online, and that's okay, right? There are times when the tech-free teacher-led approach is going to work better. And that's not a bad thing. Blended learning is all about deciding which activities will most benefit from being online and student-centered versus which activities are best teacher-centered and maybe offline. And just because we have something now offline doesn't mean we can just boop, pop it online and make it work. Not everything should be online. In fact, when we take something offline, throw it online, and it really just doesn't work the same, we call that a misfit. We should be looking for activities that maybe we haven't used before, opportunities that were not previously available to us that now are available to us because of technology. And then those tried and true offline activities can always stay offline if the offline advantages outweigh the online advantages. Now also keep in mind that just because it's online doesn't make it blended. The environment is blended when it enhances student collaboration and when it provides that choice in pace, pace, place, and or path. I see a typo there on the slide. Pace, place, and or path. And when it repurposes your time as the teacher so that again, you can work more one-on-one -on -one or in small groups with the students who need it while you have other students driving their own learning using technology. So let's take a look at the I do stage of explicit instruction and the advantages of maybe blending this stage. So when we talk about I do, we mean uh, direct instruction, worked examples, demonstrations, etc. So the advantages of blending the I do stage is that it is a great opportunity for student choice of pace. 
If we blend the I do portion of a lesson, it usually looks like putting a, a presentation or recording a presentation as a part of a screencast. Instead of the teacher being in front of the class in real time, now the teacher is providing direct instruction or a demonstration via screencast. This allows for that choice of pace because students are able to pause and rewind as needed. And it also makes the lesson reusable. Students can revisit it to review for a test, etc. It also provides student choice of path. We could provide a screencast of ourselves offering direct instruction. We could provide a quality video that we have vetted online for students to watch. We could provide reading for students who prefer to get their information from text versus a video. Um, and then students have that choice of what materials to use in order to reach understanding of the concept. They can choose what order they watch or use those resources in, uh, and they can choose whether or not they'll use something. Another advantage of blending the I do stage is we can increase opportunities to respond and immediate feedback. This is especially true if we're using tools that make this possible. So for example, if we record a demonstration and put it into a student paced Nearpod, students have control of pausing, rewinding, etc but we can also make it an interactive video and include questions that all students answer and they immediately find out if they're right or wrong. This way we have 100% of students answering 100% of the questions rather than say using popsicle sticks and calling on just a few students in class. Additionally, when students are watching this video, answering these questions, you as the teacher can be walking around circulating to see how your students are doing, answer individual questions, and really repurpose your time. Now, there are also advantages to keeping the I do stage of explicit instruction offline and teacher-centered, right? Being that sage on the stage as the teacher. Uh, and that includes things like sensory, sensory richness. You can be more spontaneous when the direct instruction or demonstration is live and in front of students, right? You can answer questions and address misconceptions that maybe you hadn't anticipated. Uh, you have the opportunity to elaborate if that's needed. And you also, as the teacher, are getting that real-time feedback from students for real-time adjustment of your direct instruction. So there are benefits to both learner-centered online, I do, and teacher-centered offline. So again, we talked about Nearpod interactive videos, student paced Nearpods, and also a Canvas content page is a great way to blend the I do stage of explicit instruction. On a Canvas content page, you can provide a variety of resources, embed videos, link PDFs, and this way students are able to control the pace at which they work, and you may even provide them with choice. Right? Choose two of the following resources to learn about XYZ. Students then have choice in path. The next stage of explicit instruction is we do. And this is where the teacher and students work together. So the advantages of blending the we do stage is that there is, again, student choice in pace. Students are able to control how fast or how slow they go. Depending on the tool you use, you could provide immediate feedback to students for those low DOK questions where it's easy to tell the computer what the correct answer is. And again, you can repurpose teacher time. While the students are engaged in that we do stage of instruction, you are actually circulating around the room, checking in with individual students, et cetera. And so what this could look like is, again, maybe a screencast with a worked example um, and a practicing applying something students just learned, et cetera. When it's a screencast and it's that we do, as the teacher, you can be working through that example, pause, and then ask the students to complete the first step, whether that is in a Google Doc, on paper, et cetera. Then the video picks back up, the teacher does that same step, and students can check to see if they're on the right track. 
that's kind of what the we do stage can look like blended. This can be done with a Nearpod student paced lesson or even a Nearpod interactive video where those pauses are built in for students to try the different steps. There are also many advantages to not blending the we do stage. And just like with the I do stage, these advantages are uh, spontaneity and opportunities for elaboration. We don't have those if the we do is pre-recorded. There's also, again, that immediate feedback for teacher agility. We're getting feedback from our students as we ask them to complete something with us. For higher DOK questions, there's immediate feedback. It's harder to provide immediate feedback for high DOK questions online because a lot of times it, they are open-ended questions and things like that. And only a live in-person teacher can provide immediate feedback on a student answer. Um, also, teachers can instantly spot and immediately address misconceptions when the we do stage is not blended and it is teacher centered. And there's also the ability for co-construction of knowledge when it isn't blended. Everyone is working together with the teacher leading the way. So then we have the y'all do stage where our students are collaborating to continue to build their skills and learn content. So advantages of blending the y'all do stage. Again, we have that student choice of pace. One way we can have students collaborate to build meeting is with a Canvas discussion. Now, when students are discussing in person, a lot of times we leave out unintentionally our more reluctant students. Students who are a bit shyer might not participate as readily in a group discussion, um, and they also might feel like they don't have enough time to formulate an answer, and therefore they don't participate. When we move those discussions online with Canvas, for example, it provides students with time to reflect, so perhaps their, perhaps their contributions will be higher quality, and it also gives a chance for reluctant students to participate without the, the vulnerability required to participate in person. Additionally, when we have collaborative things online, there's that positive social pressure that goes along with it. Students are seeing that other students are posting or contributing, and they might also feel that they need to construct a, a better answer or more positively contribute because there is that lasting artifact of their contribution, right? As opposed to a quick in-person group discussion. Because of that lasting artifact, it is also easier for teachers then to track participation. However, there's always the benefits of, of students collaborating in person, right? That real-time collaboration offers a high level of humanness, and there's that spontaneous synergy between students as they're co-constructing meaning. So if you do choose to blend a y'all do portion of your lesson, again, that could be collaborative discussions and meaning making via Canvas discussions, uh, Nearpod collaboration boards, it can also be project-based learning and collaborative projects that are facilitated with Canvas groups. So the last stage of explicit instruction is you do. There are advantages to blending and not blending the you do portion of a lesson, the advantages of making it learner-centered and online, is that immediate online feedback for those lower DOK questions. Again, it's hard to give feedback, immediate feedback to all of our students at the same time. Um, and so that's something that we can use the technology to help accomplish. In addition, uh, it is easier to create lots of opportunities to practice for automaticity. Um, a lot of times we can find tools online they make it easy to duplicate and tweak those practice opportunities. So we can provide many more opportunities than we might if it were, say, paper-based. Uh, additionally, there is the opportunity for student choice in product. If students are working at their own pace and are working online, they can access a variety of creation tools to choose how they're gonna demonstrate mastery. 
Now, of course, there are those advantages of keeping things teacher-centered and offline, and that is immediate teacher feedback for high DOK questions and tasks, which we've discussed previously. There can be increased scaffolding and direction in person. Uh, and perhaps more importantly, the teacher can jump in and demonstrate teacher agility by providing needed scaffolding or direction when the teacher sees that, that students are not working independently successfully. Lastly, when we have the you do portion of a lesson, teacher-centered and offline, there is the opportunity for hands-on practice with physical materials. There are always simulations to make that online, but sometimes really the best way to meet those learning intentions is hands-on practice with physical materials. So you do can be blended on Canvas using mastery paths. That way we are differentiating a path and pace for students based on what they already know and how quickly they're working. We can use Canvas module requirements and prerequisites to kind of control students' independent movement through materials and demonstration of understanding. And we can also make it so that a Canvas assignment has multiple submission types. This way students can choose their product to demonstrate mastery. They could choose to do a Google Slides presentation or a digital notebook, an Adobe Spark video, a Canva infographic. The options are almost limitless. Some additional considerations to make sure that your blended learning experience goes smoothly. Um, start small, right? There is no need to blend everything. Maybe pick one activity that would really benefit from being learner-centered, being digital, uh, and would really benefit from repurposing your time as the teacher to be more of that guide on the side. And just blend that one activity. Keep everything else student, excuse me, teacher-centered and non-digital. So start small, just do one thing at a time or introduce one new blended learning tool at a time. We don't want to, in a week, be introducing Flipgrid and Nearpod and Canvas discussions. Pick one, build students' capacity with that tool, and then introduce a new tool. Another way to make blended learning a smoother experience is to use evergreen activities. Sometimes these are referred to as spotlight practices, edgy protocols, et cetera. Evergreen activities are those activities where the procedure and routine stays the same, but maybe the topic is different. So the expectations for how to complete the activity don't change. Students become very familiar with them. The only thing that does change perhaps is the topic or the reading selection or the math problems provided, et cetera. Keeping your Canvas course organized um, is also a great way to make blended learning smoother. Students will know which activities to move through in which order, and they can independently access those materials and resources when a Canvas course is predictably and consistently organized. You can use the CSD style guide and exemplars, which are linked in your curriculum maps under digital teaching and learning. An additional way to make sure that your blended ex learning experience is a smooth one is to set clear expectations and procedures, not just for the activity, but also for the technology use. Just like when we're not using technology, we wanna make sure that we plan for early finishers. We want to make sure that we plan for technology support when blended learning, when blending learning. So if students are having problems with their Chromebooks, where are they gonna go? Are they gonna ask three and then me? Um, are they going to come right up to you? Have a plan because there might be glitches. Lastly, use the TPAC and SAMR frameworks to identify blended learning opportunities to enhance student learning. Both of these frameworks can help you really choose when technology can enhance that learning and help you accomplish something you otherwise wouldn't accomplish rather than just digitizing an activity with no real added benefit to student learning. All right, thank you. So some important links to remember, we have Canyons U, which provides how-to information for a variety of digital teaching and learning tools, 
frameworks and concepts, and that can be accessed at canyonsdistrict.org slash canyonsu. You can also access recordings and presentations from previous bite-sized PD offerings, and the link is right there for you. It, they are also linked through Canyons U. Lastly, if you're looking for a relicensure credit for attending this bite-sized PD, you can go to cnyns.org slash three lowercase i capital R six lowercase t capital N G. Thank you so much and good luck with blended learning.